E4 has gone through so many transitions and with the recent release of the Lions of the North DLC and the subsequent patches that followed it after the next couple of months, well now we are in the position where we have to redo some of our older videos because they're just not accurate anymore. That's right, we're gonna see what are the strongest nations in E4 in the current patch since, let's face it, some nations that were really strong before have been downgraded and because of the new added flavor that many nations received with the newer DLCs, things have seriously changed. Now I don't know how many nations will be included in this video and if there are nations that you think are insanely powerful that are not in the video, let me know in the comments, I'm always open to feedback and end of the day this is just my opinion from the many hours that I've been playing this game since the release 9 years ago, but I'm sure that there's a lot of divergent opinions out there and there's nobody right, nobody wrong. The thing that really makes you for an amazing game is the fact that it can be played in multiple different ways and it can still be extremely enjoyable and fun for everyone. First on our list is the nation of Poland. Now Poland has received a lot of flavor in the recent DLC, the Lions of the North. They have gotten a brand new mission tree and with this amazing mission tree they actually have a few branching options. That means that you can choose either to become a part of the HRE and become the holy Roman Emperor eventually if you follow that path of the mission tree or you can choose to keep your union over Lithuania and just to become a massive blob expanding everywhere forming the Commonwealth and being ridiculously overpowered in general not only that but now we also have the winged hussars available after you unlock your fourth national idea and the winged hussars are a special unit with insane stats but you can only have a limited amount I believe it is one per 100 development or something like that to limit the amount that you can have otherwise everybody would just be spamming winged kusars. One more thing that makes the Poles super strong is the fact that early on you can easily get personal unions over Bohemia, over Hungary. This has been added in the recent DLC since the uh, Varna aftermath gives you directly restoration of union CBs on both of these nations. You will have to wait for five years because you do start with the truce with Hungary until 1449 but you can attack Bohemia from day one and then just wait for those five years for your aggressive expansion to go down whilst you get ready to PU Hungary. You will also get Moldova as well as Danzig as pretty much free vassals as you will the uh, Lithuanian massive conglomerate here as a free personal union and essentially by 1449 you're gonna have around 25% of Europe from the get-go. If that doesn't say strong then you probably haven't eaten enough pierogies. It's time to try some pierogi okay and I know I'm pronouncing Poland different I'm pronouncing pierogi different welcome to the channel <laughs> this wouldn't be a strongest nations video without the nation of Castile albeit in the recent DLC Castile did not receive much of a buff it received indirectly some buffs not like it actually needed it since Castile is one of the strongest nations has been and will be one of the strongest nations no matter what the patch they start with a huge amount of development they get a free personal union over Aragon easily can enforce another union over Portugal at the same time time, expand into North Africa, create a massive colonial empire, and if you really want to, you can even restore the Roman Empire as Castile. Your mission tree does help with that, but aside from the actual mission tree, your position is amazing to do it. Your national ideas also are insanely good. You start with morale of armies and marine force limit, meaning that both your sailors pool and your manpower pool act as two manpower pools, because you can recruit from both of them units with the sailors mechanic. Castile is also one of the few nations that start with the gold mine in La Mancha and this gold mine will absolutely fuel your expansion in the early game. Plus you got another gold mine right across the strait here in Tafilalt, easy to get within the first war against the Moroccans. And if you know CB Byzantium which is a pretty standard strat let's face it, then you can also get the gold mine in Serbia after you expand a little bit more in uh, the Balkan area. So if you are an enjoyer of both going colonial and having a strong base back home in Europe, then Castile is the nation for you. I'm gonna make a side note here. Aragon is exactly the same like Castile, which is why I'm not making a separate spot for them in this video. The difference between Aragon and Castile is that Aragon does get a different mission tree and eventually you can get the Castilian mission tree if you culture convert to Castile and you form Spain. So they have that advantage, but Aragon also has the advantage of having some unique achievements 
elements like the consulate of the sea which revolves around the Mediterranean and they get way more missions that help them conquer their areas in the Mediterranean compared to the missions that Castile gets. So alternatively we could say that both Castile and Aragon are on the same spot here not like there is an actual spot because I'm just randomly saying the strongest nations it's not like the last nation's gonna be the strongest out of them all they're all equally amazing in their own rights. That being said this nation up here the Oirats are probably the actual strongest nation in the game <laughs> by far compared to everybody else. First off the Oirats are a horde and hordes have the amazing mechanic of being able to raise provinces which gives them mana points and money but not only that it lowers the cost of coring up those provinces since coring up provinces is related to the amount of development that those provinces have and by lowering that development it's cheaper so sometimes by raising a province you use the mana points that you got from raising that province to core that province up it's just massive brain but then you're asking that's something that all the hordes have ludi then you're just saying uzbek shagatai no guy everybody is equally strong whilst the hordes have that considerable advantage what makes oirats even more amazing than all the other regular hordes is the unique events that they have they have scripted in two main massively overpowered events the first one triggers once you defeat the emperor of of Ming in a battle and that's fairly easy to do early on since uh, Oirat troops are way better than uh, Ming troops are well once that event triggers you get a massive boost and the Ming troops become paper units easy to defeat the second event which is in correlation with the first one happens after you've taken control of the province of Beijing that means you just have to siege it down that's it and then that event gives you the entirety of North Ming under your your control and completely plummets the mandate of uh, the Empire of China meaning that within just two three years from the start you will have half of China under control you can enforce your peace deal you can get a huge amount of land from them because we also have the overpowered tribal conquest CB as well as the mandate of heaven CB I think I have to unpause for that one don't I yep there you go one month has passed so we can use the mandate of heaven CB now the difference is that with the mandate Mandate of Heaven CB, it only costs you 50% aggressive expansion and 50% cost to take all provinces. That means you literally can take double the amount of provinces that you would normally be able to take from Ming, which essentially means in just the first four or five years, you're gonna triple in size. There's a ton of easy to destroy nations around, like all of the Manchurian lands. There have been people that did a world conquest as Oirat in under a hundred years mainly because of these two initial events and because of the horde mechanics and using a few exploits sometimes but my point is that nothing beats oirat if you know how to play the game that being said you do need to know how to play this nation and i have a video on how to play all of the nations that i'm talking about today so just check the description you'll find a link to each nation mentioned in this particular video up next is a bit of a hybrid of a nation whilst at the launch of the game timurids i believe was a horde now it is not a horde but that doesn't make timurids any less feared because timurids has an ace up its sleeve in the name of the mughal empire after you take over and you conquer the province of delhi you can form the mughal empire which has has some unique attributes that's why on this spot we put both Timurids and Mughals because it's kind of the same country since let's face it you will form Mughals as the Timurids you do start off with five vassals and they may or may not be a little bit disloyal however that's pretty easy to handle them it's gonna get a little bit worse once your leader dies and he is already 67 he does give a special modifier that lowers their liberty desire by 50% which is keeping them in check right now there are strats to handle that though I have have a link to the latest strat for that in the description as I mentioned before and after you do consolidate these vassals take note you have cores on most of them so that means you can literally instantly integrate them in 1454 after 10 years all you gotta do is just click a button and after one month tick they will become a part of you you don't need to wait to integrate them since you have these juicy cores everywhere plus these nations also have their own cores so you can use that beforehand so you can attack say uh, Uzbeks with the cores 
cores of Transoxiana, and you also can get more cores from Ajam, Ajam being a rebellious nation that literally just rebelled prior to the start of the campaign, and they are also a part of the uh, Timurid family, as it is led by Sheikh Mohammed bin Bison Kor Timurid. The Timurid's ideas are also pretty strong, but it is actually better to take the Mughal ideas once you decide to form the Mughals. The initial missions of the Timurids revolve essentially around expansion, and they give uh, flat bonuses from that particular expansion. However, after you form the Mughals, it's a completely different story. Let's go form the Mughal Empire, get the new traditions and ambitions, and as you can see, the Mughal ambitions give insane modifiers. You got tech cost reduction, core creation cost reduction, minus 25, and cav combat ability, discipline, idea cost, minus 10%, and the most insane mechanic that the Mughals have is the fact that you actually can assimilate cultures, and whenever you do assimilate cultures, you get specific bonuses, like from assimilating the Hindustani, you get 10% core creation cost reduction extra, advisor cost reduction, cav combat ability, trade efficiency, it goes like that for the entirety of the world. Essentially, Mughal is one of the nations that was built for a world conquest, like the actual mechanics of this nation are meant to be used in a world conquest. Not only that, but check out this amazing mission tree here. It is huge, it does mainly revolve around taking over the Indian subcontinent, but it does give missions outside of the Indian subcontinent with uh, conquests into Indochina, Ming, and so on. Some of these missions are insanely powerful, like the Viceroyalty of Deccan literally gives you an entire huge nation of Deccan in the south of India, the actual strat would be not to core the south, quickly take it and then release Deccan, meaning you don't need to waste a thousand something admin points on coring these lands, you just integrate the nation later on after you've uh, created it. This clearly would not be a video about the strongest nations if we did not include the Ottomans, everybody's favorite little pog champ here, the Ottomans are insanely powerful. They have unique units, namely the Janissary Infantry, which cost 10 military mana to build and they do not take any of your actual manpower so that means you can have essentially unlimited manpower as long as you uh, have mana points but there's only a certain amount of these boys that you can actually build it's uh, limited to the amount of uh, provinces that you have which are not of your religion so that's because we have a lot of orthodox provinces in the Balkan side of our empire here is the Ottomans we can recruit quite a few Janissaries which get fire damage and shock damage received minus 10% and army drill gain modifier plus 100 but that's not the thing that makes the ottomans as strong as they are it's a number of things that make it super strong including the mission tree which is fairly standard but it does give a ton of claims in fact with the ottoman mission tree you get claims on the entirety of the mamluks and most of the middle eastern provinces for that matter you also have insanely great ideas from the beginning discipline plus five and tolerance of heathens which greatly helps since half of your country is heathens in fact you only take minus one overall heretic penalty and you do not have any heathen penalty because of the ottoman tradition meaning your heathen provinces do not actually give any debuffs instead they get minus two unrest because we have two tolerance of heathens. Later ideas include core creation cost reduction, have combat ability, and trade efficiency. But one thing that really boosts the Ottomans when it comes to conquest is their actual position. That's right, the Ottomans are positioned in the best spot for expansion. To the west of your country, you have some orthodox uh, countries which act as a buffer and then a lot of Catholic nations. Whilst to the east, it's a mixture of Coptic, Shia, Sunni, and some orthodox mixed in there. So from an aggressive expansion point of view, you can essentially dodge completely aggressive expansion, not need to worry about coalitions by attacking first Sunni nations, pausing that attack, not attacking them for a while until the aggressive expansion goes down, but you can attack orthodox nations or Catholic nations since the way that aggressive expansion works is you get more aggressive expansion if you eat a country that is the same religion as other countries around it or the same culture or on the same 
continent. It's a little bit more complicated than that. I will link my aggressive expansion guide in the description also if you're curious to know exactly how aggressive expansion works. And honestly, if you're newer to the game especially, I recommend you watch it because it teaches you how to avoid getting coalitions or if you do get coalitions, how to defeat them easily since I know most people do struggle with coalitions and you really shouldn't because it's an easy to avoid thing. Across from the Ottoman Empire is the Austrian Empire. Well, at the beginning, I guess it's not necessarily an empire. It's more of uh, the Austrian Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Since technically the Holy Roman Empire is the country which is neither holy, neither Roman and, and not really an empire. But hey, who am I to say these things, right? Now, what makes Austria really strong, aside from the fact that they are the emperor at the beginning, and that means that they get 73,000 manpower pool from day one. They get five ducats on the plus, but that's not really what really matters here. What matters is that with the Austrian mission tree, which is insanely powerful, by the way, you get huge amounts of land without really stressing from the first five years. I've got a video in which you get five personal unions in the first five years. I'm talking about Bohemia, Hungary, Milan, Burgundy. Okay, so I guess it's just four personal <laughs> unions. I may not be the best at counting, but hey, whatever, let's just move on, alright? The point is that you get your union with the Bohemians from the first month because you can get uh, secure electors super easy. All you need to do is improve relations with them. So that means mainly just ally them, get a royal marriage, send a little bit of a gift, and that's it. And then you get the restoration of union CB on Bohemia, and then either you wait until 1455, which triggers an event in Hungary that makes them a junior partner of you. It's a 50-50 chance so you can crash your game out there for if you don't get it until you do get it it's like a one in two chances or if you don't want to wait for 10 years you can get the union with hungary after the war with the bohemians since in order to get the mission that gives us the restoration of union on hungary you just need to have a little bit more development and the bohemian lands do count towards your overall development so you can get that mission instantly after you've personal unioned the uh, bohemians you also can get a free personal union on the milanese as well super early on because they get a triggered event that uh, gives you that Union CB and the Burgundian Union again is a little bit RNG but it is a triggered event which happens whenever Charles dies as a king of Burgundy and that gives a percentage chance for Austria to get the Union or again the French. It's kind of splitsies between France and Austria in this game in most situations in the early game especially. In the recent patch Austria did see some buffs though I'm talking about 5% discipline from the last national idea it used to be three percent and i think five percent is much better it's well-rounded i don't know why they came up with three percent before honestly you also have a lot of ideas that revolve around uh, diplomacy which is austria's forte but you also get some decent military ideas like morale of armies improved relations chance of new air diplo annexation costs minus 15 percent diplo reputation plus two and diplo relations plus one speaking of diplo annexation cost with uh, some of your missions here you actually can uh, stack up your diplo annexation costs and you can integrate nations super fast since now the papal legate gives another minus 10% diplo annexation cost it's even more ridiculous you can end up having like 85% diplo annexation cost reduction which means you can integrate nations 85% faster than you would otherwise there's a lot of other personal union missions in your mission tree such as conquest of galicia gives you a restoration of union on Poland so if you wait you can get a union on both Poland and Lithuania as long as the Poles have the Lithuanians as their junior partner or if you really want to wait you can just uh, PU on the Commonwealth whenever Poland forms the Commonwealth if you want to go down the Imperial path you can eventually unite the Holy Roman Empire into one country and you get to keep all of these other juicy modifiers that you had from before you were not able to keep that before but but with some of the recent patches, I'm not sure if it's the recent one or if it's the previous DLC, but one of the recent patches allows you to keep all of the other benefits whenever you do unify the Holy Roman Empire. Albeit, the strat that everybody goes for is not unify it and just wait on the revoke the privilegia, which makes every single HRE nation your vassal, but it does not count towards your diplo relations, so you have a massive vassal swarm to take over the world quite easily, which is why Austria is also a really good great nation to do a world conquest as but that being said it's it's not the easiest of nations to do it as so um keep that in mind
mind. Since we did speak about the Burgundians, let's also show why the Burgundians are super powerful. I've got a really fun run as the Burgundians where we formed the nation of Lotharingia, which is a secret nation you can form in this game, by the way. Right after you click this mission here, the crown of Lothair, you get Lothair's legacy that lets you form Lotharingia. It's a little bit further down the line. The mission tree that Burgundy has is small, but it's super good. For example, the League of the Public Wheel gives you liberty desire for all of France's vassals and the King of the French transfers all of the vassals that France has. So essentially, within the first 10, 15 years, let's say, if you play your cards right, you can have more than 50% of France by stealing all of their vassals and taking their provinces from the north or wherever you want to take them from and add those vassals up to your already established vassal swarm since we start with Holland, Brabant, Flanders, Nevers and Joe Mama as our initial vassals. Another thing I really personally enjoy about Burgundy is the fact that they got an insanely good amount of ideas. Goods produce modifier plus 15 is ridiculous. Trade efficiency, manpower plus 25 percent discipline and morale of armies meaning that you get a good balance of both diplomatic economic and military ideas as burgundy and if you really don't want to stay west burgundy you can always just form france after you've destroyed france you know what they say right you are what you eat in this case we we, we would be eating the french i guess wouldn't that turn us into a baguette though i'm so confused right now and yes you probably notice you can also form the dutch nation which is one of the reasons i really love this nation it's super versatile you can form the netherlands you can form france you can form lotharingia and it also has a ton of flavor and unique events that make this playthrough a lot more interesting than most playthroughs you're gonna have in the game up next is everybody's favorite russian nation muscovy the blob that keeps on blobbing <laughs> and probably the easiest nation to form russia as Russia is the real MVP here in this area once you form it. I'm not saying you cannot do it as Novgorod. In fact, I think it might be more flavorful to do it as Novgorod, but it is a lot more difficult and Muscovy is insanely strong compared to Novgorod. You do start with five vassals, Perm, Belusero, Yaroslav, Rostov, and Puskov, and you have an insanely easy expansion path. Your mission tree again does give you permanent claims on your neighbors and surroundings. Would invade Novgorod giving you claims on the entirety of Novgorod. Then you also can go and expand into Kazan, Great Horde, No Guy, whilst at the same time you can expand into Lithuania, Poland. So it's kind of the same like the Ottomans. You have three different religions right around you, so you can expand into Orthodox lands, Catholic lands, and Sunni lands. So by doing this, you avoid aggressive expansion. You avoid getting a coalition due to aggressive expansion, better yet. Muscovy also pretty much has an endless supply of uh, manpower by raising the Strelsi, a unique ability to uh, the uh, Russian principalities. Raising the Strelsi does not cost any manpower, so that means these people come from out of space. That's the only explanation we have here to the fact they do not cost any manpower at all whenever you raise them. Or they can be undead. <gasps> oh my god, are these the undead horde? Knyaz Vasily II is the Leech King, isn't he? I'm just kidding. I don't even play WoW. And if you do, you should be ashamed of yourself. How dare dare you play that game after 20 years it's been out for come on it's time for a new game like newer stuff like eu4 which is only nine years since it's been out okay another country similar to the ottomans the mamluks originally created by turkic slave soldiers and now ruled by circassian slave soldiers. well they're not really slave soldiers anymore are they since they're ruling the country but yeah the point is that the mamluks is in one way similar to the ottomans but at the same time it is quite different it does have a unique government mechanic and some bonuses that help it out. What makes this nation shine, however, is the easy access to a lot of small and insignificant countries that it can quickly gobble up, increasing in size considerably. Plus, at the beginning of the game, Mamluk troops are better than Ottoman troops. So if you really want to destroy the Ottoman Empire, you know CB Byzantium, and then you kill the Ottomans before they get military tech 5. At the same time, you can vassalize most nations around the Ottomans, and 
you can kill all of the Arabian nations, expand into Ethiopia, which means you're going to get access to gold provinces and continue expanding to get access to even more gold provinces in South Africa. It is a special play, however, since if you don't destroy the Ottomans early on, it's going to be considerably more difficult. The Ottoman units scaling up massively and after Tech 5 and especially after Tech 9, the Ottoman armies are insanely stronger than the Mamluk armies are. So you want to get rid of them before they get to that point. Also, guys, I want to mention that I'm trying to get to 160,000 subs before the end of the year. So if you enjoy the content, consider subscribing. It would really help me out so much and mean the world to me. I do this full time. So I promise I will always try to improve the content. I'll try to improve the quality of the videos and I'll stop eating this pen I've been eating for the past half hour. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Ming. But the reality is that despite the fact they start with an insane economy, 35 profit from the get go and the manpower pool of 71,000, Ming has a very frail situation where if you don't know how to play as Ming, because reality is that Ming is one of the nations that is extremely different in play style compared to any other nation in the game because of the mechanics of the Mandate of Heaven. They can make you super strong or can make you super weak if you don't know how to handle it. In my Ming video in the description, you'll find out exactly how to play as them and what you need to do to avoid collapsing. So do check it out. And of course, we also need to talk about France, the absolutely most insane nation that everybody knows is insanely powerful. Some people have even formed the Roman Empire as France by 1550, some even earlier. The mission tree they have is quite old. Reality is that it's not really the best mission tree, but that's not the thing that shines about the French. The thing that really shines about the French is the fact that they got cores on all of the provinces that the English have at the beginning. So with these provinces taken from the first war against the English, as well as with the integration of your vassals, you start with close to 500 development, easy access into the uh, British Isles, meaning you can easily take over the entirety of the English Channel node, which is the richest node in the game and can stay as such. You can get a few wars against the Aragonese and Castilians and pretty much gobble up all of Iberia without too much repercussion. Or if you really want to cheese it, you can try and get a PU over Castile, which is also doable as long as you change your starting dynasty to a Trastamara. Similar to the Austrians, you get a free personal union on Milan and you also get a free personal union on Naples as soon as they become independent from the Aragonese. Or you can use Provence, vassalize Provence and use them to get the Neapolitans. If you want to, you also can become the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire by improving relations and being friendly with the electors, dethroning the Austrians and sneaking your way into the empire without having to cut down in size. And aside from all that, you also can go into the new world. So you have the choice of either destroying and conquering all of Europe. You can do a massive colonial empire or you can do both of those. There's so many different strats for this nation and it's just probably the best nation to use if you're new to the game, especially since there's no way you're going to mess this up. It's just way too powerful to actually lose as this nation. I mean, by just looking at the development map mode, we see that most of France is super high development, especially tax dev, and you can uh, reinforce that tax dev bonuses by building up your monument in Versailles that offers an extra 20% national tax modifier for the early campaign anyway. You can mix that in with the new reforms added in the recent patch as well and you can get up to a hundred extra, actually I think 113 extra percent tax modifier, which equates to about a hundred ducats. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, check out this amazing Ottoman run until the next time. And I want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons, channel members, and Twitch subscribers. I would not be able to do this without all your support.